So um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, I can say that we at the Web3 Foundation, we are so inspired by um, just how much interest and excitement there is uh, around Polkadot uh, here in China. Um, and uh, our commitment going forward is that this is uh, going to be a really focused market for us. Um, uh, we're going to deploy a lot of capital and a lot of time and, uh, and human resources into, uh, uh, into being a, just a collaborative partner um, in this market. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll walk through ways uh, to get involved. Uh, and I'd love to hear feedback from all of you uh, for ways that, that uh, we can um, collaborate and, and seek partnerships uh, here in China. So uh, we'll start with Web3. Um, and what is Web3? Uh, Web3 is Gavin Wood's vision for a decentralized serverless internet uh, where users have greater control over their privacy, their data, their financial accounts, and ultimately their freedom online. Where decentralized peer-to-peer -peer networks leverage trustless incentivization through sound crypto economic design. And why do we call it Web3? We call it Web3 because it's the third major evolution of the internet. Uh, we started in the 90s with Web1. Uh, that, those were static websites. Um, and uh, monetization was mostly an advertising model, uh, really poor UI, UX. Uh, then we moved into uh, Web2 in the, in the 2000s. That was social and mobile. That was uh, more interaction with, uh, with websites, more user-generated content, uh, so on and so forth. But the, the business model of Web 2 mirrored the business model of Web 1 in that it was mostly an advertising but targeted advertising. And so Web 2, we, with Web 2, we saw the dawn of what we call surveillance capitalism, uh, where a few companies own uh, the vast majority of your data. They analyze that data to sell you ads or, or sell you products through ads. Uh, and this has led to a massive consolidation of power and wealth uh, online, uh, where again, only a few people and a few companies control the vast majority of uh, power and wealth. Uh, and so we are moving into a new generation of the internet, uh, one that we're all very excited about, and that's why there's so many people here uh, tonight where decentralized applications are built on uh, WebAssembly virtual machines and then compiled down to, to WASM VMs and, uh, and communicate with one another. Where monetization is built directly in at the protocol layer. Uh, and we find this um, to be a much more interesting uh, monetization scheme overall. Uh, users have better control over their data, better control over their privacy, and very importantly, there is much more, a much better distribution of power and wealth online. If we look at the Gini coefficient, which, which is a representation of wealth in, say, Bitcoin or Ethereum, um, it's actually much better than what we've seen in, in Web2 or society at large. So while they're not perfect, we are moving in the right direction when it comes to the distribution of power and wealth. Uh, and I think as we continue to evolve Web3 technologies, we're going to see this also continue to evolve. Again, a very small group of companies control the vast majority of uh, cloud compute, cloud storage. Uh, they control all of your data, and they commercialize it as they see fit without including you uh, uh, in that monetization. And so. Uh, I often find people in, in uh, Web3 technologies have a really strong desire to not share any of their information, to have maximum privacy. Uh, and that's really interesting, and, and, and I respect those people. I myself am not really in that boat. Um, I would be fine with sharing specific data with, um, uh, with certain companies so that they can run uh, you know, machine learning algorithms and, and, and develop their products better. However, I just want to be paid for sharing my data. Uh, I want to participate in the business model of my data. 
Uh, and Web3 technologies enable that. Uh, and, I, and we think that that's, that's very, uh, very compelling. So the Web3 Foundation and, and the concept of Web3 generally was founded on this concept of less trust, more truth. We shouldn't have to just trust that a company that controls all of our data won't be evil. The web should be set up so that those companies can't be evil. And this is really the founding principle of Web3 and, uh, and the Web3 Foundation. So the, with the Web3 Foundation, we have some core beliefs that, uh, that, that we hold. Uh, one is that we can create borderless public goods commons. These are networks that transcend geographical borders uh, where we can share information, share data, share value, uh, and, and interact with one another without censorship. Where transparent representation is achieved through uh, uh, coherent governance. And that coherent governance is a noble pursuit. There's a lot of discussion uh, today in crypto about crypto governance and on-chain governance versus off-chain governance and, and so on and so forth. We are squarely in the camp of pro-on-chain governance. We think that on-chain governance will allow us to evolve networks faster. It allows for a more transparent uh, conversation about the issues that a network faces. And then if people can, uh, can buy into a system where they know how decisions are made and, the, and that they're made transparently, they're able to make a better decision whether they want to be a part of that community or a part of that system. Uh, we also believe that we need more safe spaces for experimentation. You know, for better or for worse, because markets are leading indicators, the value of certain crypto networks has outstripped where the technology has gone. And we've gotten to a point where certain crypto networks are now too valuable to experiment on. The, you know, should the experiment go awry, it's millions or billions of dollars lost. And we need to be able to create safe spaces to continue to evolve networks, uh, experiment, and push the vanguard of this technology forward. Uh, and finally, and I think this is just a tenet that, that everybody in the space believes, is that when you create a appropriate crypto economic design, you create a uh, Nash equilibrium between network actors. And then between those network actors, they contribute valuable behaviors or resources or behaviors and resources to networks. This is sort of the, found, the foundational elements of crypto economics. So enter Polkadot. And what is Polkadot? Polkadot is interoperability infrastructure for Web3. It sits at the center of Web3, allowing different crypto networks to communicate with one another. Uh, it is an incredibly technically ambitious project that brings together a number of novel innovations um, from a novel consensus uh, uh, mechanism, a hybrid consensus uh, called Babe and Grandpa, uh, arbitrary smart contract messaging, uh, parallelized security, and a number of other interesting things that I'll get into, but more importantly, Gavin will get into uh, as we move forward. Uh, a native governance mechanism uh, allows us to guide this network and accelerate innovation while uh, securing the network and ensuring minimum quorum is achieved. Uh, and then the primary implementation is led by parity. And I've spent the last uh, sort of six plus years evaluating teams all over the world in this space. Uh, and I have not come across a team that has just such a deep technical bench of uh, really some of the leading minds pushing the vanguard of this technology forward. Um, so it's wonderful to be able to work uh, in this community and with this team of really some of the leading technologists under Gavin Wood's leadership. So quick high level overview of uh, of Polkadot. We've got a, a, a relay chain. Do, does this work? It kind of works. So we've got a relay chain uh, and then parachains can connect into the relay chain if they're built, say, using the substrate framework and compile down to a web assembly. Uh, they can then communicate with one another. 
if a chain has a set of legacy technologies, it can also connect into the relay chain, but it does so through a bridge chain, um, which, which can, can fairly easily be spun up. And then that allows for all of these chains to communicate with one another. And uh, communication means broad uh, smart contract call capability cross-chain. So an Ethereum smart contract can call an EOS smart contract and say a Tron smart contract can make it, uh, can call a Definity smart contract and a Definity smart contract can send a transaction on the Zcash network and so on and so forth. And this is really the first big aha moment with respect to Polkadot, something that uh, when looking at Polkadot, I became extremely excited. Allowing for, so there are other interoperability of blockchain uh, projects out there, but most of them are centered around uh, cross-chain token transfer through, say, bonded validators or, um, or some kind of hub and spoke mechanism. Uh, what Polkadot allows for is arbitrary cross-chain messaging, uh, which is, a, again, a much broader scope much more technically ambitious and allows much more interaction between certain chains. Uh, what this will enable is totally novel use cases and total, totally novel capabilities for different chains. And this is achieved through async, uh, the uh, ability to perform asynchronous messaging between different chains. So if you have uh, a DAG, which is a uh, lightning fast uh, transaction throughput, say like uh, AVA, uh, it, can, it can communicate with, say, Ethereum, which is a slower today proof of work chain. And the fast chain like AVA can't front run the slower chain, and the slower chain can't revert the faster chain. So it allows for, it has the flexibility to allow for different chains with different consensus mechanisms to communicate with one another. And it's the only, pro the only, only interoperability project on the planet that allows for this. And so uh, how does this work? So in, in, in today's model, uh, if a contract or chain or shard are going to communicate between a sender and receiver, they have to have the same consensus mechanism. They have to be synchronous. They have to sort of be based on the same set of rules. But with Polkadot, the uh, sender and receiver can have different consensus mechanisms. And the way that we achieve this is through, again, the, consen the hybrid consensus Babe and Grandpa, where Babe propagates blocks very, very quickly, but then Grandpa only finalizes those blocks when both chains uh, are, are sort of ready to finalize a, a given block. And so you've got this two-step block uh, production and finalization, which allows for this asynchronous messaging. This is an incredibly um, interesting innovation, which really enables this arbitrary cr cross-chain messaging between totally different platforms. So the second like big kind of breakthrough and aha moment that got me really excited about Polkadot is the concept of uh, pooled security or shared security. And so because of that, uh, of that relay chain where messaging is sort of routed through, uh, instead, of, instead of separating security or having this hub and spoke model where you have what I call economic scalability constraints and you can only send a, a, a certain limited amount of value from one, uh, from one spoke to another, because you're sending it through the, the relay chain, you're only limited by the economic scalability of that relay chain, which will be very significant. This allows for chains, for parachains, to offload their security to the relay chain and share it among uh, uh, other chains. And so this becomes really important because as we move into a multi-chain universe, and I think everybody here should be aligned to that we're moving into a multi-chain universe. Uh, maximalism is a ridiculous concept and, uh, and there will be many chains with many use cases that need to, that will inevitably interact with one another. And so 
as we have many different chains and we move into a more competitive era of our industry, in a, you, you're not necessarily going to be able to incentivize and bootstrap your own set of miners or validators and be competitive with other chains. You're going to need to share resources, dropping transaction fees, and dropping the cost of security. And pooled security allows you to do this. And so I've done some back of the napkin calculations on this. And you know, today to secure a layer one chain costs somewhere in the millions, it's paid for with inflation to miners or validators, right? Costs somewhere in the millions, or, or in the case of Ethereum, hundreds of millions a year, or in the case of, of Bitcoin, uh, billions a year. And uh, with, with Polkadot, in sh with using shared security, we're able to bring that down by massive orders of magnitude. And so by, based on some calculations, we've arrived at, at hundreds of thousands of dollars per year to secure your chain rather than millions or hundreds of millions of dollars a year to secure your chain. This is a huge step forward, right? Uh, and again, critical as we uh, move forward to a more competitive era in our industry. Uh, it's really not going to be possible to continue to spend money and incentivize miners to, to um, bootstrap your chain. So the third really interesting thing and this, is a, this was uh, a trend that I've been seeing as an investor in the space for um, a little more than a year now. I'd say almost two years uh, uh, starting very soon. Where we had this, this, this generation, this era, where we thought that uh, you know, the consensus mechanism would be, would be set and you'd have one single consensus mechanism. And then we would layer other layers on top of that to abstract away the design inefficiencies of that consensus mechanism, but the whole world would use just that one consensus mechanism, and these layers would do away with the inefficiencies. And then somewhere between layer two and layer four, there would be an app layer, and the apps would bring the users. And the reality is, it didn't play out like that. You know, uh, the, the, the app users didn't come because Using a crypto app was greater friction than using the, uh, whatever their alternative was. And, and so what we're seeing is this paradigm shift in the industry where the best teams want to design their own chain from the ground up for their users and their specific use case. Uh, they can't be subordinate to some design decision that wasn't made for their application. So, for example, if I want to create um, a light client app for high frequency trading, it's totally impossible for me to do that, say, on like a proof of work chain or, or even uh, proof of stake chains today. I would probably use, again, something like a DAG, uh, like, like AVA. And that would allow me to have a lightning fast transaction throughput. And then I would design, I would make the design decisions in the rest of my chain exactly based on what my users want. And I can make my own application specific chain. Control that user experience so that when the user uses it, it's seamless and it works. And it doesn't feel like this friction filled, difficult experience that, you know, that doesn't attract the mainstream user. To attract mainstream users, we need to have frictionless frictionless experience for those users. Um, and this paradigm shift is something that is key. Oh, whoop. There we go. All right. This paradigm shift is something that is key in order to achieve the next sort of set of goals for our industry, which is attracting that main mainstream audience. Um, so a fourth really interesting thing. Uh, is Parity Substrate. So Parity Substrate is a development framework. Think of it like an SDK or, um, uh, or toolkit to spin up smart contracts really easily and deploy them or together with another tool that we call Cumulus, deploy smart contracts as parachains on top of Polkadot. And so everybody in the Polkadot ecosystem who's building something will need to make a design decision that starts with 
do I need to make a uh, parachain for myself and, and own that entire experience, or do I need to make a smart contract and deploy that on a parachain? And there's a set of trade-offs that are inherent with, uh, with each one, and, uh, and each developer will need to go through that for their specific use case, given their users. And I won't get into those, but I think maybe Gavin will, Gavin will touch on this a little bit further. So what do you get with Substrate? I'm not going to run through everything here, um, but some, th some interesting things to highlight. Uh, you get uh, Light Client uh, native out of the box. So think of Substrate like a, like a blockchain in a box, right? And Gavin did a really interesting demo at last year's Web3 Summit where he took a MacBook out of shrink wrap, spun up um, a blockchain, and deployed an application on top of that blockchain in about 15 minutes. This is something that took years of a team that would fill this room to develop and now can be done in a matter of minutes with Substrate. Uh, and so some, inter some other interesting things in this sort of blockchain in a, blo in a box where you can plug and play your own consensus mechanism and your own security model. Uh, native light clients um, is an important step forward. Uh, I, for, for one, I've been in the space since 2012. I would have thought that we'd have light clients solved by now and that light clients would have pro proliferated by now. Haven't seen it. We're going to see it with Substrate and with Polkadot, and I think that's really compelling. Um, so you can, uh, you know, run a full node off of, say, your, your laptop or your, or, or, or your cell phone. Um, uh, we talked about that, that finality gadget with, syn uh, with chain synchronization, um, secure networking. So the networking component of Polkadot is a really important one um, to be able to have that fast communication uh, cross chain. And obviously, um, that connectivity, that liveness, both liveness and security cross-chain is achieved through Substrate. Uh, so the last sort of fifth big like aha moment for me with, uh, with Polkadot is something of particular interest. Um, an area in the space that is very popular right now. Um, I don't know if popular is the right word, but it's certainly a point of heated debate right now, and that's crypto governance. That's governance, whether it's on-chain or off-chain, and how it should be designed, and so on and so forth. And uh, some important elements of Polkadot's governance model. You have referendums, so you have votes on, on measures. There is a council that is subject to rotating approval voting. And I'm going to get into all these, these points in a minute. There are some really interesting novel security mechanisms, like adaptive quorum biasing and time lock of voting and delayed enactment. And then something very, very uh, exciting about Polkadot is the, um, uh, is the Treasury DAO, where a part of the block reward will go into a DAO, and then token holders will vote on the distribution of that block reward, uh, uh, of those rewards. Uh, and so it's, the block reward isn't just designed to go to transaction validators. It's designed to incentivize all of the valuable components of this uh, community. And that means app developers and protocol layer developers and uh, you know, uh, community managers and people getting involved and doing different types of work. And you'll be able to be paid directly by the protocol, directly by this treasury DAO for contribution to the community. And we think this is incredibly exciting. So quickly, um, the uh, uh, Polkadot governance model. So there's a council, again, subject to, to uh, rotating a, approval voting. The council can table measures for, uh, for voting. The uh, token holders have sort of the ultimate backstop say in what gets, what gets passed and, and doesn't. So they vote on tabled motions. And then any dot holder can propose a motion, or they can sponsor a motion and sort of get it upvoted to have it uh, be tabled and voted on more quickly. Um, but whether the council proposes a motion uh, unanimously or proposes it 
by majority vote will change uh, what is required from the quorum uh, of dot holders. So enter adaptive quorum biasing. Uh, you know, Gavin will be remembered for many important innovations in this space, but I am quietly optimistic that this is actually uh, uh, one of the more fantastic ones. And this is a way to essentially achieve quorum independent of the turnout for voting. So if there's something that we've seen, if, there, if, if we step back and we take an observation of what we've seen in crypto governance up to date, we've seen very low turnout. So if we, if we look at one of the early uh, crypto governance uh, um, uh, projects, the DAO, the big problem with the DAO was that we didn't achieve minimum quorum on a very obvious measure that was proposed by, by my friend, uh, the creator of Ava, uh, Ava Labs, Emin Gunsir, uh, on the moratorium. And, and, and so we had kind of a Brexit situation where everybody knew that it had to be passed, but then nobody actually got out and voted for it. And we see very low turnout in crypto governance in, in other projects. In MakerDAO, uh, it's sort of mid-single digit turnout. In, in uh, Aragon, we're seeing low single digit turnout. And so what the observation here is, not all votes really get high turnout, but we need a way for the network to evolve independent of whether there's been strong turnout or not. And so adaptive core biasing achieves this. If the, if the council proposes something unanimously, then probably it's a pretty good measure that needs to, to go through. There is, there is one set of quorum that, it, that is required if a, if a dot holder proposes something, then it's a different uh, quorum that is required. And as we move to lower turnout, we need more yeas over the nays to carry that vote. Uh, or in the case of the council proposing unanimously and low turnout, you need more nays over the yeas to carry the vote. And so it's a dynamic way to control quorum based on turnout so that we can continue to evolve the network. Because at the end of the day, crypto governance is about evolving the network forward. Um, and I think this is a really, really elegant system uh, that, that allows for this. Bob Charlie, uh, Alice only has one dot, but she believes very strongly in a measure, so she time locks it for eight weeks. Bob also believes pretty strongly, so he's got three dots. He, he, he locks it in for six weeks. Charlie doesn't really care, so he only locks in for two weeks. In this case, Bob carries the vote. In the other case, uh, Alice and Charlie uh, have the same, you know, uh, have the same amount of dots and carry it for the same number of weeks. Bob doesn't care so much about this measure, so he only locks up for four weeks. Alice and Charlie carry that vote. Now, what's important here is if Alice and Charlie carry the vote, Bob can sell his tokens and move out, while Alice and Charlie are locked into the system for as long as they committed to. So it allows you to give more weight to your vote if you really believe in what uh, it, uh, in this vote. However, you're then locked into the system as a result, and the, and the, the ones who lose the vote can move on. Um, another very interesting thing that I am personally really excited about is the roadmap. So today we're in POC4. Um, we uh, strongly encourage you to, to get involved, run a node. Um, participate in, in, in some of the, the test nets. Uh, moving into the summer, we'll move into to code audits, and then hopefully, uh, if all things go well, uh, releasing mainnet near the end of the year. And this is really what, what got me excited to, about Polkadot is not only are there all these innovations being proposed, all these really cool things that are going to be fun to, to, to uh, play around with and, and allow for the, the network to evolve, but it's all going to be available now. I don't have to wait for two or three years for this to go from concept to actual, actually implemented. This is available soon, this year. Um, so that's really exciting. And, um, and we're, we're very grateful to the Parity team for all their work uh, in this regard. Again, spending a lot of time evaluating teams in the space, to my knowledge, this is the only sort of major layer one project in the history of our industry that will ship ahead of schedule. It was scheduled to ship well into 2020, and through a lot of hard work from this team, um, right now they're on pace to be ahead of schedule. 
Uh, so let's see how that goes. So cool things being built in Polkadot. Um, one thing that one project that I'm really excited about is Edgeware. So Edgeware is a smart contract platform where apps can be deployed very cheaply and permissionlessly to Polkadot. So Edgeware is, will be t will be tied into into the Polkadot network. It'll be the first pair chain on Polkadot, and you can permissionlessly deploy any application that that uh, that you'd like and be able to play around with that. But more interestingly with Edgeware is that it's a network specifically designed to evolve uh, the governance model. And, uh, and so it'll use a, a crypto governance model that's very similar to, to, to Polkadot's. In fact, we'll start as default the same, but maybe the governance model e evolves in a different way. And you'll be able to participate in this governance. Uh, as a default, half of the block reward will go into a DAO and the, the token holders of this DAO will vote on how that is spent. So you can get involved and you can offer to build apps and uh, make protocol layer upgrades and run nodes and all these other things and get paid directly from the Edgeware DAO based on uh, uh, the votes of the community. Uh, another very compelling innovation of, of Edgeware is the distribution mechanism. So uh, to my knowledge, this will be the most fair uh, distribution me uh, methodology that we've seen today, to date, um, where we are giving away over 90% of the tokens to the community based on a lock drop. So you can lock up your ETH for three, six, or 12 months, and you get, uh, you'll get your ETH back at the, that, at the end of that period, no matter what, but then you get edgeware, or you get edge tokens based on how long you've locked up uh, your ETH. And then you can play around with the network, participate in governance, run nodes, uh, uh, and use those tokens uh, in any way that you want, uh, right, from, you know, right from the genesis block, but then you'll get your ETH back uh, anyways. And so this is a way that people can get involved in this network and start to play around with crypto governance with, at very, very low opportunity cost. And we're excited about what this means. And then Edgeware Lever Chain for, for maximum performance on Polkadot. And so we're really excited about uh, where this is going. Other really interesting collaborations. Chainsafe is building a Golang implementation. We also invite others to, to think about building implementations. Our friends at Protocol Labs, we use the uh, libp2p. Um, uh, Pokascan is an interesting open source uh, block explorer. Uh, ChainX here in, uh, in China uh, will deploy, to my knowledge, I think more than one parachain. Uh, I think they've got a couple in the works. Chainlink is a really interesting oracle. Uh, so there's all kinds of, there's more than two dozen projects today building uh, and getting ready to deploy on Polkadot. We've been incredibly grateful and really excited about uh, the community reaction to Polkadot. So our grants and collaborations program, which I'm a part of, um, we have issued a number of grants this year already, and we're going to continue to issue uh, more. Uh, we are participants in the ECF as well, very proudly. Um, we're going to be expanding our grants scope uh, over the course of this year, so I recommend for you to uh, search for our grants page on, on GitHub or grants.web3.foundation, and you can uh, apply for a grant. And we've got a wish list uh, on that website that goes through all the different things that we're looking for, but IDEs and developer tools, crypto economic simulators, um, wallets, explorers, new implementations of Polkadot uh, in, novel, um, uh, in novel scripting languages, high privacy messaging, uh, validation clients, one-click nomination GUIs, all these things we're looking for. Um, and uh, grants can be issued in fiat, in dots, in a combination of fiat and dots. So we strongly encourage you to reach out, uh, get involved, uh, make an application for a grant, build something cool, and there's all kinds of opportunities to, uh, to be a part of this ecosystem. Uh, and it's all remunerated because at the end of the day, uh, rule number one of crypto economics is people respond to financial incentives. 
We've got an amazing global community, uh, including here in China. Again, we're so grateful and so uh, excited by, by just the interest and, um, and turnout of, of all of you and, and people all across China that, that we've been meeting this week. Um, and uh, I will make an announcement tonight. Uh, so you are the first to know that uh, the second iteration of the Web3 Summit will happen in Berlin at the Funk House, uh, August 19th to the 21st. This really was last year's premier crypto event. It brings together some of the leading minds of Web3, of uh, privacy, of security, and obviously of crypto. Uh, and it's a really cool vibe that transcends the idea of, of a blockchain conference. It goes way beyond that. And so we strongly encourage you um, to, to come and participate. Uh, if you go to one crypto conference this year, uh, this is really the one. And um, for the next two weeks, starting as of, I think, a couple of hours ago, um, we have discounted pricing for tickets. They're only $199 for uh, developer tickets. So if you're a developer and you can demonstrate that you are, um, you, you get a really great price uh, on this amazing event. Um, this is a, a, a fantastic deal. So uh, come and join us. We're hiring. We're looking for more partnerships and collaborations. We're certainly looking for more um, collaborations here in China uh, for building community and uh, building more uh, applications and uh, and new projects specifically for this region because, again, this market's going to be so important for us going forward. We're such believers in everything that's happening here and, again, humbled and excited by, uh, uh, by the interest in, in this market. And so thank you again for coming out and thank you again for your interest in Polkadot.